Amen. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you on this lovely Sunday morning. Are you happy you're saved? Amen. Let's all stand, please. We're going to grab our blue songbook and go to number 296. Number 296. We'll sing all three verses of follow on. Follow, follow. I will follow Jesus. Number 296. Think of the words as you sing. Join the first. Down in the valley with my Savior I would go, where the flowers are blooming and the sweet waters flow. Everywhere he leads me I would follow, follow on, walking in his footsteps till the crown be won. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus, anywhere, everywhere, I would follow on. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus, everywhere he leads me, I would follow on. Down in the valley with my Savior I would go on. Where the storms are sweeping and the dark waters flow, with his hand to lead me I will never, never fear. Danger cannot fright me if my Lord is near. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus anywhere, everywhere, I would follow on. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus everywhere he leads me, I would follow on. Down in the valley or upon the mountain steep, close beside my Savior would my soul ever keep. He will lead me safely in the path that he has drawn, up to where they gather on the hills of God. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus, anywhere, everywhere, I would follow on. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus, everywhere he leads me, I would follow on. Did you catch the words of the second verse where it says, Down in the valley with my Savior I would go where the storms are sweeping and the dark waters flow. You ever feel like you're there sometimes? Amen. With his hand to lead me, I will never, never fear. Danger cannot frighten me if my Lord is near. Amen. Amen. That ought to bring joy to your heart. Amen. It's good to see everybody this morning on this beautiful day. Amen. In the middle of July. Hallelujah. Amen. You glad you're saved? Yeah. Amen. All right, everybody got to give, their, give me their Colgate smile, okay? Everybody, big old smile, big old smile, big old smile. Mm. Some need, anyways. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It's good to see everybody this morning. Let's bow for prayer and we'll get started this morning. Brother the Paso, do you mind praying for us, please? Amen. You may be seated. Turn over to number 336. Constantly abiding. There's a peace in my heart that the world never gave. A peace it cannot take away. Though the trials of life may surround like a cloud, I have a peace that's come here to stay. Number 336. We'll sing all three verses. Constantly abiding. Think of the words as you sing. Join me in the first. There's a peace in my heart that the world never gave. A peace it cannot take away. Though the trials of life may surround like the clouds, I have a peace that has come here to stay. Constantly abiding, Jesus is mine. Constantly abiding, rapture divine. He never leaves me lonely, whispers all so kind. I will never leave thee. Jesus is mine. All the world seemed to sing of a Savior and King when peace sweetly came to my heart. Troubles all fled away, and my night turned to day. Blessed Jesus, how glorious Thou art. 
constantly abiding. Jesus is mine. Constantly abiding. Rapture divine. He never leaves me lonely. Whispers also come. I will never leave. She is my own last. This treasure I have. Temple of claim. While here on his footstool I roam. But he's coming to take me some glorious day over there to my heavenly home constantly abiding jesus is mine constantly abiding rapture divine he never leaves me lonely whispers also kind i will never leave thee jesus is mine Amen. Hey. Howdy. howdy so on the way home uh, sunday night uh going down jacob wrote a, a button buck popped out in front of us he was like prancing around in front of us and stuff it's cute. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I gunned it. <laughs> no, no, I didn't. <laughs> yeah, I need somebody to come take care of this deer. <laughs> um, this morning we look out the window and the backyard, and there was like five, or six rabbits leaping around each other and stuff, and um, three turkeys. <laughs> and a flock of crows <laughs> so i don't know what's going on some kind of weird convention <laughs> so uh, i don't know what's going to be there when we get home to this. Uh, so today's uh missionary letter is from hebron ministries dr marvin smith uh, pastor marvin smith um and it's long i don't know where to cut it so i'm going to see if i can read it here um Dear supporting friends and churches, when we began the first session, the husband was seated at one end of the couch and his wife was firmly planted at the other end. The space between them was vastly larger than the single empty cushion in the middle. Betrayal, frustration, heartache, and years of unfulfilled expectations had taken their toll and now left this marriage on the verge of collapse. Both were emotionally drained from days of angry words and tears. I could see that they were at their wit's end. They had driven across several states to sit down with us, and I breathed a quick, silent prayer as the gravity of the moment gripped me. I turned to the husband. May I begin with you? Take me back to your parents and your childhood. Where did you grow up, and when did you trust Christ? He began to tell his story. For an hour, he laid out everything that led to his becoming a pastor and marrying, marrying his beautiful wife. Then I turned to her, and she did the same. I made notes as they spoke and asked pointed questions. When she had shared her background, I turned back to the husband and said, now tell me when you think things started going wrong in your marriage and why. How did you get to the point that we are at today? In turn, both shared their perspectives. It's amazing how much can be self-discovered by simply facilitating this type of conversation and taking the time to let each other talk in front of one another openly and honestly. So often in these conversations, couples discover things about one another that they never knew, even after decades of marriage. Often they discover things about themselves that they never really considered or never took the time to ponder. After that, we had listed everything they said was wrong. I asked them both, now let's think together. Are these really the problems your marriage is facing today? Or, you do th or do you think these things are simply evidences pointing to something deeper that is the real problem? Have we exposed the root of the tree or are we just looking at the leaves? Four hours passed in what seemed like moments. Tears were shed, secrets were brought into the light, lists were made of long-standing wounds, both shallow and deep, patterns were discovered, 
Motives were expressed, and understanding one another seemed clearer than ever before. Oh, the hurt was real, and the betrayal of broken vows could not be undone, but as we closed the session with prayers and made plans to meet again the next day, their faces shone with hope. They seemed eager to take the next steps. The next day we spent the first hour using what we had learned the day before to reveal the spiritual strongholds when each, within each of their souls that held them in bondage to frustration, unforgiveness, and bitterness. We revealed the avenues they had opened in their souls to the spiritual enemy and the lies that had come to believe, they had come to believe about themselves, about others, and about God. We spent the second hour showing how the wounds from their youth and early marriage experiences had resulted in tainted perspectives and expectations, creating barriers to the spiritual, emotional, and physical intimacy of their relationship. This had been building over time and opened the door to specific temptations. As they grew apart, the enemy took advantage of the open door and planted the seed of betrayal that led to broken vows. In the final hour, we set to prayer. There was no longer empty space on the couch between the couple. In fact, as the husband first, then the wife began praying, I looked up to see them clinging fiercely one to another with tears streaming down their cheeks. One stronghold at a time, they renounced their selfish sins and relinquished their hurts and bitterness. In the authority of the risen Christ, they claimed the blood of Jesus and cast down the lies that had controlled them. Yeah. They each begged one another's forgiveness and forgave every other person who had wronged them. It was truly a beautiful sight that I will not soon forget. Yeah. I have to be honest, I was crying as hard as they were. I'm about to cry. <laughs> they were filled to overflowing with awe and wonder at the matchless love and grace of God who beats the devil with his own stick. Amen. Uh, mountains move a mile in the face of a single grain of faith. Right. Oceans swallow sins that seem unforgivable. Walls that reach to outer space crumble into dust before the power of his cross. Jesus saves. Amen. He saves sinners and he saves Christians. We must apologize for the tardiness of this ministry update and thank our prayer and financial supporters for your patience in laboring with us the way you do. Hebron ministry is unique in its scope and operations. At times we fall short of our own expectations and partner communications, but it is our desire to improve. We will not make further excuses, but please know that our time and your investments are being bled to the last drops for profitability in the kingdom work of God. Amen. Hundreds of hours of personal counseling have been invested in individuals, couples, and families from around the country over the past 90 days. These have passed through our counseling, our counseling offices both in Fort Dodge, Iowa, and Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. Thousands of miles have been traveled and many states traversed on land and in the air for the purpose of preaching the message of restoration, hope, and winning spiritual warfare by the power of the gospel. Amen. Hundreds of phone calls, dozens of lengthy sessions, numerous victories won, many people helped. We could go on. These are very specific couples and families that are still together and healing today as a direct result of the prayer and financial support you've given over the past three months alone. Thank you. Pastor Smith preached warfare conferences in Utah, Pennsylvania, North Dakota, Alaska, Missouri, and Illinois this quarter. Harvest Baptist Church in Fort Dodge, Iowa, hosted its 21st Annual Spiritual Warfare Conference in April, and we will share details concerning the meeting in our next letter. Your prayers and support are vital to the work we accomplish in the strength of the Lord. Let me share how you can spe pray specifically with us at this time. A family who left the mission, number one, a family who left the mission field and came to us for counsel and healing several years ago has now been led of God to begin deputation and make preparations once again to return to the field. We are delighted with them over all God has done and are excited for their future. We are happy to recommend this family for support, and if you'd like to help them achieve their goal, please reach out to our offices for more information. Two, pray with us for additional resources to house those in need whom the Lord brings us. Three, Pray for much wisdom and spiritual insight for the part of our counselors who daily need discernment in their sessions with needy people. Pray for the power of the Holy Spirit upon them, for spiritual protection, and for preparation in the hearts of the hearers that they might willingly receive the truth in humility. Now let's pray for Brother Smith and Pastor uh, Jay Goldsboro. Uh, Lord, I do thank you for 
Harvest Ministries. I pray that you continue to help them reach people to strengthen Christians and broken families. And I, I pray that you'd uh, help them to continue to win souls for Christ. I pray for the morning service here that you'd bless us in a special way. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Brother Marvin Smith doing a great job over there in Fort Dodge, Iowa. Did you catch that part where he says, God saves sinners and saves Christians? Not only saves us from the fires of hell, but having hell on earth in our lives. And uh, Brother Marvin Smith does a great job pointing people to the principles of God's word because God will not violate his word. And when we apply the principles of God's word in our life, we will enjoy the benefits from it. Praise the Lord. So, amen. That's, uh, that's our uh, faith promise dollars coming coming to fruition, bearing fruit to our account, restoring, a, restoring another home one at a time. Amen. Isn't that great? Amen. Before we uh, continue, I want to recognize uh, some visitors that we have uh, with us this morning. Miss Ashley, you've got uh, somebody very special next to you. Could you do us the honor and introduce him to us? Good to meet you, David. Glad you came to David. David, this is uh, his uh, um, coming here. His uh, children, Logan and, and Leland and Ashley and Rhea. Uh, you know, all, all the family, yeah, that's right. David, glad to have you. Glad to have you. Let's make him feel at home. Let's give him a hand. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen. Miss Dorothy, you've got a new face next to you. Could you introduce to us your, your friend? Tanya. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tanya. Let's give her a hand. Thanks so much for Tanya for coming. Amen. Amen. That's great. That's great. Good to have you. And by the way, uh, be sure to, uh, we want to wish Miss Dorothy a happy birthday this week. She's got a birthday coming up. Amen. Praise the Lord. And we want to uh, wish Miss Shar Hively a happy birthday. Happy birthday, Miss Shar. So glad. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, don't forget after the service, the food pantry will be open, and that is in the gym, and that is for everybody. So feel free to please go by and uh, let that be a blessing for you. Amen. Amen. Let's grab our hymn books. We're going to go to one more song, number 145, number 145, as we stand in preparation for the scripture reading to follow. Number 145, it is well with my soul. Think of the words as you sing. How about we sing all four verses? It's such a precious hymn. It's such a precious, precious message. Number 145, it is well with my soul. Join me on the first. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roam, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul, it is well with my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul, though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless esteem and has shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. I sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul, it is well. 
my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Sing it out on the last. And Lord, is the name. My faith shall be signed. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Amen, amen, amen. What a great song. Amen. If you knew the history behind that song, amen. Wow. Let's grab our Bibles. We're going to go to the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms. If you just open up to the middle of your Bible, it should be at the book of Psalms or very close to it. Psalms. We're going to go to Psalm 65. Psalm 65. Psalm 65. Psalm chapter 65. I'm going to ask Brother Tony if he would come and lead us in our scripture reading from Psalms chapter 65. Good morning. <clears throat> Open your Bible to Psalm 65 between Genesis and Revelation. You'll find it. <laughs> I agree with preacher. If you want to want to read a good bit of history about some of these hymns that we sing every Sunday, you look up it as well with my soul when you get home and see the history behind that hymn. And if it don't bring tears to your eyes and uh, soften your heart, it's amazing how someone could write that if we're going through what the man went through. So wonderful hymn. That being said. Psalm 65, I will begin, and you respond accordingly. Praise waiteth for thee, O God, in Zion, and unto thee shall the vow be performed. O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. Iniquities prevail against me, as for our transgressions thou shalt purge them away. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest, and causest to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. By terrible things in righteousness wilt thou answer us. O God of our salvation, who art the confidence of all the ends of the earth and of them that are afar off upon the sea, which by his strength setteth fast the mountains, being girded with power which still at the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves, and the tumult of the people. They also that dwell in the uttermost parts are afraid at thy tokens. Thou makest the outgoings of the morning and evening to rejoice. Thou visitest the earth and waterest it. Thou greatly enrichest it with the, with the river of God, which is full of water. Thou preparest them corn when thou hast so provided for it. Thou waterest the ridges thereof abundantly. Thou settlest the furrows thereof. Thou makest it soft with showers. Thou blessest the springing thereof. <clears throat> Thou crownest the year with thy goodness. In thy paths drop fatness. They drop upon the pastures of the wilderness, and the little hills rejoice on every side. Verse 13 together. The pastures are clothed with flocks, the valleys also are covered over with corn. They shout for joy. They also sing. Let's pray. Father, thank you for gathering us here together, Lord. You're a mighty God, a powerful God, a loving God, Lord. And we don't always live up to our namesake as children of God. We confess that this morning, Lord. We're asking you, Lord, to do a work in our heart, challenge our hearts, touch our hearts, Lord, to move our feet today, Lord, after we hear this message. May all we do here be found favorable and pleasing in your sight, Lord. We're not looking for a, a, a normal service here, Lord. We're looking for lives to be changed. And if anybody here doesn't know Christ as their Savior today, they receive Christ as their Savior before they leave here, Lord. Do a work in us. Use us, Lord. May we not walk out of here saying that was a good message and then do nothing with it. You want us to go do and, and show people our faith through our actions, Lord. We know, what, we know that there are 
sometimes they grow tired of hearing us and we need and people know what we believe by what we do and not by what we say lord so challenge us encourage us lord lift up our pastor lord as he shares your word and teaches and preaches out of your holy word this morning lord in jesus name we pray amen amen you may be seated what a psalm that lifts our heavenly father lifts his name and lifts all that he has done as he deserves to be lifted up and honored and praised everything that we do ought to be done for the honor and glory and praise of our heavenly father Amen. i want to draw our attention though to the very first verse where it says praise waiteth for thee o god in zion and unto thee shall the vow be performed. That phrase at the very beginning, praise waiteth for thee, O God, in Zion. This morning I want to talk about when to praise God. When to praise God. Heavenly Father, please, Lord, help us this morning to catch what you're trying to teach us in your word. Lord, I, I need your help. Without you, I can do nothing. Lord, your people are gathered here with hungry hearts, wanting to hear from heaven. I pray that they would hear from heaven. I give you myself to be used to speak your message. Speak to all of our hearts, even my own. Comfort hearts. Encourage our spirits. Help us to see your grandeur and your majesty and your power and your glory. And believe by faith in our mind's eye what you can do and how you can take care of us. Please meet with us this morning. I pray that you please lift up Jesus. May he receive the honor, the glory, and the praise. Bless the children and the leaders in children's church, across the street and downstairs and the nursery workers. Holy Spirit, you have free reign of this whole property to move as the Heavenly Father sees fit. Please meet with us this morning. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> There's a hymn, an old classic hymn, that goes like this. Glorious things of thee are spoken, Zion, city of our God. He whose word cannot be broken formed thee for his own abode. On the rock of ages founded, what can shake thy sure repose? With salvation's walls surrounded, thou, may, thou mayest smile at all thy foes. See the streams of living waters springing from eternal love. Well supply thy sons and daughters and all fear of want remove. Who can faint while such river ever flows their thirst to assuage? Grace, which like the Lord, the giver, never fails from age to age. Round each habitation hovering, see the cloud and fire appear. For glory and a covering show that the Lord is near. Thus deriving... From their banner, light by night and shade by day, safe, safe they feed upon the manna which he gives them when they pray. Savior, if of Zion City I, through grace, a member am, let the world deride or pity, I will glory in thy name. Fading is the worldling's pleasure, all his boasted pomp and show, solid joys and lasting treasure, none but Zion's children know. The Bible talks much about this place called Zion. In fact, 153 times the name Zion is mentioned in the Bible. The first time it's mentioned is in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 7, speaking of Daniel, David taking the stronghold of Zion, the same as the city of David. Zion is called the city of David. The Bible talks further in 1 Kings 8, verse 1, it talks about Solomon assembling the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes and the chiefs of the father of the children of Israel. They came to the city of David, which is Zion. It's where David brought the Ark of the Covenant, the piece of furniture in the tabernacle that represented God's presence. Psalms talks about Zion. Zion was a place that was associated with holiness, Psalms says. It was a place where people knew that God dwelt, as Psalms 9-11 declares. It was a place where one could gain strength, as Psalms 20 and verse 20, 20 and verse 2 says. It was a place that was associated with joy, according to Psalms 48 and verse 2. 
It was a place associated with rejoicing. It was a place known for its beauty. It was a place that God loved. It was a place that God held special in his heart. It was a place where God was great. It was a place, according to Psalms 102, verse 16, where that God would build up. It was a place where God's name was declared. It was immovable. It was a place that God chose for his habitation. It was a place from which God's blessings flowed. It was a place that was sung about. It was a place filled with God's judgment and righteousness. Isaiah says that Zion was called the city of the Lord and was associated with the Holy One of Israel. Micah says it was a place that was associated with the law of God. Zechariah says it was a place that was held a very special place in future prophecy. So this place called Zion is a place that's associated with God's presence. It's a place associated with joy and rejoicing and God's law and God's righteousness, his blessings and holiness and beauty and the Holy One of Israel. So the author in Psalms chapter 65, our text verse, verse 1, he says, Praise waiteth for thee, O God, in Zion. You see, of all places in the world that praise waits for God, it's in this special place. Zion was a place where praise to God was expected, anticipated. It was a place where praise to God was as common as air is to the lungs. There's a debate about where the old tabernacle and the temple were located. Some think that it was in the what they call the Temple Mount of today. Some believe it was right next door to it. But it doesn't matter where, in fact, it was. The psalmist says, wherever Zion is, wherever we see or, or understand where Zion is, praise waits for God there in Zion. Zion was a place to praise God. It was expected to be there. It was the logical place for it. It was anticipated. But my, my question to you is this. The psalmist wrote, Praise waiteth for thee, O God, in Zion. But let me ask you this question. Does praise wait for God, number one, in my happiness? You see, it's expected in Zion. But what about my happiness? When things are going well. When money is when money's flowing in. When the job is good, when my health is good, and the blessings are flowing, and I'm not living paycheck to paycheck, there's a little bit left over at the end of the month. Isn't that a nice place to be? That's a nice place to be, to be able to put a little back for a rainy day. Does God's praise inhabit that time as well? God's blessings are flowing. There's a visual increase in life. Good times are rolling. Do I even think about God during those times? Much less praise Him. Romans 1.28 says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Sadly, there are some who they don't like to retain God in their knowledge. They descend in that cycle of depravity. God is so good to them. Amen. God is so good to them. But yet in their goodness, in that goodness that they enjoy, they do not praise the Lord. Does God get praise in my happiness? Of all the places I'm going to mention, that one is the easiest. Because, yes, it is, when things are going good, it, it is easy to praise God, isn't it? When there's peace in the home, it's easy to praise the Lord. When the children are all lining up so prim and proper and doing exactly in, in accordance to what Mama says, it's easy to praise the Lord, isn't it? It's easy when all the church members are behaving themselves, Amen. But each of the following places I'm going to mention, it will get increasingly more difficult. Does God's praise inhabit my happiness? Number two, does God's praise, does praise wait for God, number two, in my heart? 
Let me ask you this question. Who, speaking of what mortal human, who can see your heart? You cannot see inside a person's soul. Only God can do that. No other mortal human can see inside your, your soul unless Jesus was in his glorified body. But no other mortal human, no other person like us does praise wait for God in my heart. That's in my secret place. That's in my inner man. Drop this verse down. It says, Proverbs 4 and verse 23, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. In the Old Testament, there was a tabernacle that the Jews had as the center of their camp. In this tabernacle, it was made up of different parts. They had a outer courtyard, which was fenced off. They had a fence around it, and then they had that courtyard on the outside of the actual tent structure called the tabernacle. Then they had the tabernacle structure that was made of skins, and it had two rooms in that, in that tent. One was called the holy place, which was in the front, and one had the Holy of Holies, which housed the Ark of the Covenant in the back. See, the outer, car, the outer courtyard, this, this tabernacle was, a, was a, an example of our own life. That outer courtyard, it represented our external world. The world that we interact with every day. The, the, the world where the general public crosses our path. And they, they pass through. Then they had the holy place, which was the first room of the actual tent. And that's a place where a certain select few could enter, the Levites, the priests. They could enter there to get refreshment. They had the table of showbread. They could do the offices that they were supposed to do in there. Not everybody could go in there. The general public couldn't go in there. That was the holy place. And then there was the holy of holies. And that Holy of Holies was a place where the high priest once a year would go in and put blood on the mercy seat. It was reserved. It was a place reserved for a, a very select person. Very few people through the course of the centuries could go in there. That's a representation of our life where this, this outer courtyard is our external world. Then we have a holy place in our, in our being where we have a few intimate, more intimate people who come in and they interact in our lives. And then we have that holy place where it's only maybe one person, possibly a spouse, but especially God that, in, that, inter, that intercedes or that, uh, that we commune with in this holy place. Let me ask you this question. Does praise to God inhabit our life? Does it inhabit our heart? In these private places, in these secret places. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, What know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? That tabernacle picture of the Old Testament is what God used as an example to then, to then transfer the, 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 the idea of our body is that. Our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Does, God, does praise to God inhabit our heart? Does praise to God inhabit our secret life in our inner man? Are you saved? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, then the Holy Spirit now dwells inside your temple. Amen. Does praise to God inhabit there? See, it's logical if it's in Zion. It's logical at the church to praise God. It's logical when, when you're in the, the house of God with the people of God around the Word of God. It's logical to, to praise God there. But what about in my happiness when it's my own life? What about in my heart when it's my secret life? Let me ask you another question. Does praise wait for God, number three, in my hurry? 
in my hurry, in the hustle and bustle of our daily lives, do we take time to praise the Lord? Do we take time to give thanks to the Lord? Do we take time to think about Him? In the midst of all that we have to do, do we take time to remember Him? Isaiah 30, verse 7 says, For the Egyptians shall help in vain and to no purpose. Therefore have I cried concerning this. Their strength is to sit still. Wouldn't it be nice just to have some time to sit still? Wouldn't that be nice not have to, to constantly be on the grindstone and in the hamster wheel of life to keep the world turning? Don't you feel like that's, that you're in the hamster wheel of life and there's a belt that's, that's running down to the center of the earth just to keep the world, world revolving? But reality is maybe this. In 2 Kings 4 and verse 26, the lady says to the prophet, Run now, I pray thee. Or the prophet says to his servant, Run now, I pray thee, to meet her and say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, It is well. It is well. She said, It is well, but... If you know the story, her, her child was laying up in the prophet's chamber at her house, unresponsive and unconscious. She thought she had died, he had died. Yet when she talked to the servant of the prophet, she said, it is well. Her heart was hurting. In her heart, in her hurry, she was hurrying to try to get help for her child. The hymn, It Is Well, was written after traumatic events in the life of Horatio Spafford. The first two were the death of his four-year-old son and then the great Chicago fire of 1871, which ruined him financially. He'd been a successful lawyer and had, investi had invested significantly in property in the area of Chicago that was extensively damaged by the great fire. His business interests were further hit by the economic downturn of 1873, at which time he had planned to travel with, to England with his family on the SS Ville de Haver to help with D.L. Moody's upcoming evangelistic campaigns. In a late change of plans, he sent the family ahead while he was delayed on business concerning zoning problems following the Great Chicago Fire. Did you know the city of Marshall, Michigan was designed in the image of Chicago. You can go to downtown Chicago and they will take in some of these businesses and show you where the old boardwalk was. There was the boardwalk on street level and then there was the second level boardwalk. You could walk from store to store and never even touch the street. That's how they were designed. But when Chicago fire, great Chicago fire happened, they closed all those second story because of fire safety. While crossing the Atlantic Ocean, though, the ship, on which his family was, sank rapidly after a collision with the sea vessel, the Loch Urn. And all four of Stafford's daughters died. His wife, Anna, survived and sent him the now famous telegram, which said, Saved Alone. Shortly afterwards, as Stafford traveled to meet his grieving wife, he was inspired to write these words as his ship passed near where his daughters had died. Bliss called his tune Ville de Haver from the name of the stricken vessel. The words of it go like this. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my soul, for me, be it Christ, be it Christ, hence to live, if Jordan above me shall roll. No pain 
shall be mine, for in death as in life thou shalt whisper thy peace to my soul. But Lord, tis for thee, for thy coming we wait. The sky, not the grave, is our goal. O trump of the angel, O voice of the Lord, blessed hope, blessed rest of my soul. And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend a song in the night, O my soul. Does that sound familiar? Does praise for God wait for me in my happiness? When things are going well. Or am I too distracted for him? What does the Bible say? Every good gift and every perfect gift cometh from above. If God blesses you with good times and things that rejoice your heart, take time to thank him for it. Does praise wait for God in my heart when I'm alone? Do I take time to think about him? Does praise wait for God in my hurry when my life is in its hustle and bustle? Does praise wait for God there? It's logical for it to be in Zion. It's logical. It makes sense for it to be where God's house is. But what about in my own personal life? Number four, does praise wait for God in my head? What does Philippians 4 8 say? It says, finally, brethren, what sort of things are true? What sort of things are honest? What sort of things are just? What sort of things are pure? What sort of things are lovely? What sort of things are of good report? If there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. My thought life. Is it negative? Is it worrisome? Worry is a sin, you know that. It's a, it's a, it's a sin because you're, you're not trusting God. You're trying to, to work out in your mind a problem that ought to be given to God. And wisdom should be sought for. And just, Lord, I'm going to give it to you. Is it bitter? Is bitterness in your mind? People have wronged you in the past, and, 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 and the memory of them, it hurt. yes, it hurts. You can go to God and help, have him heal your heart. Is there vengeance in your heart? Isaiah 26, 3 says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Wouldn't you rather have peace in your heart than vengeance and bitterness and, and worry and all of those negative feelings inside, God can help give that to you. He'll give you peace in your heart, but you've got to keep your mind stayed on him. Psalms 44, 1 says, We have heard with our ears, our, O, o God, our fathers have told us what work thou didst in their days and times of old. Wouldn't it be nice to, for God to do a work in your day so then you can tell the future generations, hey, this is what God did in my heart. I praise the Lord that God has been working in my life through, throughout my whole life, and I'm able to tell my kids, this is how God has changed me. This is what I went through, and this is what God did, and this is how God worked in my life. You remember what great things God has done in your past? You ought to take, note, take a notebook and start writing them down. You start writing down how good God has been to you, and your heart's going to be going to start rejoicing, because you, you're just going to start realizing God's been really good to me. It'll change your your way of thinking. Amen. Yeah, and then you can once they're written down, then you can go and review them from time to time. You, you get a little down and, and depressed, you get kind of sad in your heart. You can take that out and start remembering what what all good God has done for you. Maybe you have a hard time recalling. Ask God to reveal it to you. I just, I, what rejoices my heart is, is just thinking about my family history. How good God has been to our, to our family, to, to bring us, our family from Finland. If you know anything about the Finnish people, they're Lutherans and they're drunks. And that's what my family would have been, that, my, I've had family members who've gone and met my extended family over there, and that's what they do. And that was, that was what I would have been 
had God not divinely brought my sixth generation back grandmother over here and my sixth generation back grandfather over here moved into Portland, Oregon and caused them to be married and then brought salvation to our family line by the grace of God. Number five, does praise wait for God? Number five, in my hurt. In my hurt. When it's unnatural, it's natural to want to, when you're hurt, lash out. They tell, they tell you if you're, ever, if you're ever working with wild animals and you've got an injured animal and it's, it's, you're having to work with it, you better be careful. Because what, what does nature say? Lash out. You could really get hurt. Same thing with humankind. When people are hurt, that's when they tend to lash out. But that's when we ought to be praising the Lord. Does God's does praise wait for God in my heart when it's unnatural? When it's unnatural, the natural tendency when you're hurt is to complain. The natural tendency is to to gripe about it. The the natural tendency is to plot revenge or strike back. One person said, "Common people praise God when things go well. Uncommon people praise God when things are not." Amen. A lot of truth in that. I love this, this song. It's entitled, God Wants to Hear You Sing. Their chains were fastened tight. Down at the jail that night, still Paul and Silas would not be dismayed. They said, it's time to lift our voice, sing praises to the Lord. Let's prove that we will trust him, come what may. The chorus goes like this. God wants to hear you sing. When the waves are crashing around you, when the fiery darts surround you, when despair is all you see, God wants to hear your voice. When the wisest man has spoken and says, your circumstances is broken as can be, that's when God wants to hear you sing. He loves to hear our praise on our cheerful days. When the pleasant times outweigh the bad by far, but when suffering comes along and we still sing him songs, that's when we bless the Father's heart. God wants to hear you sing when the waves are crashing around you, when the fiery darts surround you, when despair is all you see. God wants to hear your voice. When the wisest man has spoken and says, your circumstances is broken as can be, that's when God wants to hear you sing. You see, praise is expected in Zion. It's anticipated in Zion. It's a logical place for it. But does Praise, wait for God in our happiness when things are going well. Does praise, wait for God in our heart when I'm communing with God alone? Does praise, wait for God in my hurry, in the hustle and bustle of my life? Does praise, wait for God in my head when I bring to memory the things to praise God for? And does praise, wait for God in my heart when it's unnatural and uncommon. First Peter 3.14 says, But and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Verse 17 says, For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Be the kind of child of God that lives unnaturally. Don't, don't run your life just based off of human nature. No, determine, I'm going to live the Christian life where the rubber meets the road. You know those hard, those hard scriptures to, to, to bless those that curse me? I'm going to live that. I'm, I'm going I'm to beg God, give me, give me, strengthen me to that point where I can bless those that curse me. I can pray for those who despitefully use me and abuse me. I can pray sincerely, not pray for God to kill him. No, pray for God to bless him. Yeah, right? You want to, David, in Jesus' name. David, David if you read through the Psalms, you'll, you'll see that David, he also, he prayed for God to kill some of his enemies. But maybe he was growing too. Just because he's in the, he wasn't perfect. Maybe he was, and he's just being vulnerable and honest. God says, pray for them which despitefully use you. Pray for God to bless them. 
That's when you know, God, it, something's happening in your heart because it's unnatural. You know, this is God because I actually prayed and begged God for my, to bless my enemy. That's God because I know me. Amen, right? You will, I don't know about you, but I've lived with me for 47 years. <laughs> and you've lived with yourself for however many years that is. 29. And all the ladies, 29. Right? Except, Except for if you're under 29. <laughs> you know what help? Get a hymn book. Get a hymn book. Learn, learn the songs. Get a hymn book. You can look a lot of those hymns online and, and hear very people performing them very conservatively and learn the tune of them. And then as you're walking with God, you can open up the, the, the hymn book and sing praises to the Lord. In, in the darkest times of life, you can be singing praises to the Lord. Listen to him daily. Fill your heart, your mind, your soul with praise to the Lord. Something that would glorify and honor him. Fill your heart with that. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You know why you're speaking gossip and you're speaking bitterness and you're speaking complaining and you're speaking griping? Because that's what you're filling your heart with. Fill it with praise to the Lord and guess what's going to ooze out? Praise to the Lord. It's, it's the old, uh, it's the old uh, computer adage, garbage in, garbage out. Well, good stuff in, good stuff out. When your apple cart gets tipped over, when your glass gets bumped the wrong way, when your clay pitcher gets shattered, the world will discover the light that was burning inside all along like they did with Gideon. The world will taste the sweet water of your soul like they did with Stephen when he was being stoned to death for his witness for Jesus Christ. The world will savor the sweet flavor of the fruit of your heart, your soul, and your mind like they did with Jesus when he was hanging on the cross. And what did he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Praise waiteth for thee, O God, in Zion. That's a logical place for it, is it not? But does praise wait for God? In your happiness, when things are going well. Does praise wait for God in your heart when you're alone, when you're communing with God? Does pray, do, do, do you, let me ask you this question. Do you go to God only when problems are going, uh, when problems are happening and you're complaining to him about it? Fix my problem. Fix my problem, God. And so he fixes the problem. See ya. Yeah, He gives us those problems to draw us to him because he likes to talk with us. He likes to hear us talk. Right. And so sometimes he'll leave us in the problem because he's getting conversation out of us. Uh, hey, I can't get you to come either other way. Either way. I'll fix the problem, but I just like hearing you talk. Yeah. Yeah. Does praise wait for God in our hurry when life is a hustle and bustle? Does praise wait for God in our, in our head when the way we think, the, uh, what we remember of our past? Does praise wait for God in our hurt when it's unnatural, when it's uncommon, when it's hard to do? It's easy to praise God in Zion, in happiness. But what about when we're hurting? What about when we're alone? It's logical to praise God in Zion. It's expected. It's anticipated. But what about when we're alone, when we're in our hustle and bustle, when we're hurting, when our heart is bleeding? God says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. He wants you to come during that time. He wants you to come. And that's when we ought to praise the Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this truth from your word. I pray you please challenge our hearts. Please, Lord, help us as your children, as we go about our day to keep our minds on you. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Lord, that's hard to live sometimes. Please give us the strength to live it, though. Holy Spirit, please remind us of this truth. We need your help. We're tender sheep of your pasture. We need you to strengthen us. 
And sometimes we just need you to pick us up and to put us where we ought to be. Lead us to those green pastures. Lead us to those still waters where our soul can be refreshed. It can be strengthened. We can do what we ought to be doing. Sometimes, Lord, we just need your help. We ask that you please help us. Help us. Help us, Lord, to always have on our lips praise to you. In the places where it's logical, where it's expected, where it's anticipated, but especially when it's uncommon and unnatural, when it's hard. And show to you with our, the fruit of our lips, show to you the love, the depth of our love for you. That we're not just going to praise you when things are, are going good. We're going to praise you all the time. Because we recognize that you're working in our lives. And we're so grateful that you are. Please help us. Strengthen our hearts. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're here today this morning and you don't know Christ as your Savior, let me ask you a quick question. If you were to die today, are you 100% sure you'd go to heaven? Are you 100% sure? I'm not saying, I'm not asking if you're a church member. I'm not asking if you're a good person. I'm asking, are you 100% sure if you were to die today that you'd go to heaven? The Father wants you to know that. He wants you to become his child, but he leaves it up to you. Maybe you say, well, I, I'm a good person and I try to do, do what's right and I try to take care of my family and I try to, try to be good to the, to my, to the family uh, that God has given me. That's, that's great. That's great. The Bible says there's a specific thing a person needs to do to be able to know that they're going to heaven when they die. The Bible says that we have to understand that we're all sinners. No one is perfect. None is righteous. No, not one. The Bible says for all have sinned. We're, we're all sinners. You're, look, you're, you're listening to a preacher who, who, who sins daily, multiple times a day. I try not to, but I do. We're all sinners. We're all sinners. And because of sin, if we do nothing about those sins, then we're responsible to pay for them. Romans 6.23 says, well, the wages of sin is death. We're responsible to pay for them. And if we do nothing about them, then we will pay for them. The Bible says, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. And whosoever was not found in the written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. Revelation 21.8 says, All liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, the death of the soul. If a person has sinned and dies in their sin, the Bible says they have to pay the price for their sins. And that death includes death and hell. Some people say, well, how could a loving God send people to hell? Sin sends people to hell. A loving God, if he weren't a loving God, he wouldn't have even mentioned anything about it. It would have just happened. But his love is shown by the fact that he forewarned us and told us about it so that we could seek a remedy. And of all things, he provided a remedy for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He let us know there's a problem. He let us know the consequences. Then he let us know he has already resolved the problem if we want to use his resolution. And then he says in Romans 10, 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All a person has to do is understand they're a sinner. Understand if they do nothing for their sins, they're going to pay for it. If that doesn't sound appealing to them, they can consider Jesus, who was sent by God the Father to die on the cross, to live a perfect life, die on the cross, be buried, raise again, shed his blood for our sins, be the propitiation to God for his wrath, to appease him, to do everything that needed to be done to make the way open for us to be able to go to heaven. The only thing left for us to do is to call on him, to believe in him as our Savior, to believe in the work that he did for us on the cross, 
as our salvation. To receive him as our savior. That's all a person has to do. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For whosoever believeth in him should not perish, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. You say, Pastor Daniel, I want to get that settled today. I've got a, a doubt in my heart about my eternal destiny. I want to get that settled right now. Then, my friend, do this with me. I'm going to pray a simple little sinner's prayer that you can repeat with me in the quietness of your heart. And you can whisper it to God right where you are. And you can ask him to come into your heart right now. And to save your soul and make you his child and to forgive your sins. If you would like to pray that right now, you just say this prayer simply to Jesus. Say something like this Say, Dear Jesus, I understand I've sinned. I'm not perfect. And I heard what the word says how that if I die in my sins, your word says I deserve to go to hell. But I don't want to go there. I want to go to heaven. I believe your word says that Jesus was sent to earth from heaven to take my place on the cross, to pay for my sins with his death, his burial, his resurrection. And Heavenly Father, I open my heart to Jesus Christ and I receive him as my one and only Savior, I reject the idea that I can trust my goodness to help me get saved. I trust only in Jesus to save me and to take me to heaven when I die. Jesus, please come in my heart. I open my heart to you. I receive you as my Savior. Forgive me my sins. Wash me in your blood. And when this body dies, Take my soul to be with you. I pray this in your name, Jesus. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you say, Pastor Daniel, I prayed to Jesus just now, and I asked him to save me. I would love to rejoice with you. I don't want to call you out or draw attention to you. But if you would quietly just raise your hand real quick and put it down, that you prayed and you trusted Christ as your Savior just now, I would love to pray with you. Amen. Anyone else? Praise the Lord. Anyone else? Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for these that have raised their hands, that have decided to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, you please give them peace in their hearts. Help them to know that you're, they're your children and that you love them. I pray, Heavenly Father, you please... Give them that peace and that assurance in their heart. Help them to understand what we talked about. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand, please. And we have Miss Melissa play hymn of invitation. The altar is open. How about we use the altar this morning? How about we praise the Lord for all the goodness that he's given us. Just come and give praise to the Lord because of all that he's done for us, the blessings that he has poured upon us. He deserves it. He's worthy of it. Let's pray.
Scarborough Blues Song Book. We're going to go to number 143. Number 143, we'll sing the first and last verse of Blessed Assurance as our closing hymn. And then we will have prayer and then observe the Lord's Supper immediately following. Number 143, first and last verse of Blessed Assurance. Join the first. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Amen, amen. Amen. Let's be the kind of child of God that loves God for who he is, not just because of how we feel. And sadly, many, many a children of God, there's a very shallow relationship and there's a deeper relationship God wants us to have. May we be challenged to, to praise God when it's, when it's hard. Amen. Amen. We're going to pray and then you can be seated and then we're going to observe the Lord's Supper. Uh, immediately following. So let's bow for prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you, Lord, for this truth from your word. Thank you so much for encouraging our hearts. Thank you so much for, for letting us know uh, how, we can, how we can grow in our relationship with you.